says, oh, I believe it. We believe if you said, if yeah. You said, Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in your sight. God, you are our strength and our, and our deliverer. Bless us now, God, in this preaching moment for your glory. Let your word go forth. Never ever to come back void, but accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. So right now, God, have your way. And we would be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In the name of Christ, we do pray, God. And we give you thanks. Let us all say together, amen. Amen. Stand with me all over the building. Turn with me to the 118th Psalm. The 118th Psalm and the 22nd verse. The stone which the builders rejected is become the headstone of the corner. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is a day which the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Let's start again at the beginning. Verse 22. I can tell that's not King James because the shells and stuff are not in there. The stone which the builders rejected is become the headstone of the corner. The Lord hath done it and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. The scripture as it is written, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and each other. Why we shout when we shout. Why we shout when we shout. Part of our basic belief is that God is the three O's, the three omnis, omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Omnipresent means that God is everywhere, all the time and all at the same time. God is in both north and south at the same time, east and west at the same time. God is present here and there at the same time. God is not limited to time and space. Wherever you left, God was. Wherever you're going, God will be. And God will be with you every step of the way. David once said, trying to articulate this mind-boggling concept of being everywhere, all at the same time, he said, Whither shall I go away from thy presence? Where can I go that God won't be? If I had the wings of the morning which is a metaphor for when morning breaks. He says, if I flew to the uttermost parts of the sea, God would be there. In other words, when morning breaks at the first light, and light moves at 225,000 miles per second. He said, if I could go that fast, moving across the Galilean Sea, when I got to the shore on the other side, God would already be waiting to say good morning. God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. God has all power. 
They talk about all power, not only in terms of dynamis, which is dynamite, something explodes and turns things upside down, tills, presumably it turns things right side up. Is the power to move things around dynamis. But also Zeusa, the authority. And Jesus said, I have all power in heaven and earth in my hands. That's authority. It means if I speak it, things are set in motion by my command. Starting with let there be and everything that could be, should be, would be. Started lining up rank after rank, straining to become. God has authority over the demons to say, come out from among them, authority to dispatch angels from heaven with infinite speed, with swords unsheathed, authority. God has all authority. He can wake up in the middle of a storm with matter in his eyes in the form of a human and yet not surrender a bit of his godness to say to the tempest, wind and rain and sea, that's enough, be still. They said, what manner of man is this? A man who as God still has all authority. And God not only has all, is all omnipresent and omnipotent, but God is omniscient. God knows all things. You can fool a lot of people about a lot of things. You can't fool God about anything. God knows. God knows what you show God, and God knows what you're trying to hide from God. Hmm? Sometimes we concede that when we've messed up or are messing up but don't want to change and we say the Lord knows my heart that means we know we wrong but we like what we doing mm. no the Lord knows you trifling God knows everything because God knows the heart that's why David had to concede Lord let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. Because I know you hear what I'm saying, like everybody else, but I also know you see my heart. That the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. God, you are our strength and our redeemer. God knows everything. It's that third omni that kind of provides a segue, Brother Derek, into the text. Um, because... There's a few places in scripture where the Old Testament writer, the Yahwist scholars call them, three primary Old Testament writers, the Elohist, the Deuteronomist, the Priestly, and the Yahwist. The Yahwist writes and speaks of God in very anthropomorphic means. Anthropomorphic means human-like. When you start talking about the face of God, God doesn't have two eyes and nose and a mouth and ears. Those are human characteristics that we assign to God to make a point. Genesis says God came walking through the garden in the cool of the day. God don't have two legs and stand up straight like Homo erectus. Those are human metaphors so that we can paint a picture with our words of what was going on in the text. And so there's a few places in scripture where the writer, for lack of better terminology, speaks of God having regretted something God had done. It says God repented in himself. At the, in Genesis 11, when it says, all the thoughts of man were only evil all the day continuously. You thought we were messy, Elizabeth. This says that all the thoughts of man, which included woe man, were well, all the f were only evil all day long, continually said God before the flood to explain why God wiped the world that God had not too far in the past made is because we were just wicked to the bone. And he said God repented as if God said, man, I don't know if I should have done this. And see that bumps up against omniscient because it suggested because that God couldn't see this coming 
And part of omniscient is not only to know everything now, but is to see everything coming because you not only are in the past, you're also in the future. So it's almost irreconcilable, the sense of God's omnipresence, which sees he's everywhere, including in the future. How can you suggest that God repents or regrets something as if he didn't know it was coming? And um, it says that in a couple of places of scripture that God repented in God's self to convey the sense of how bad we can be sometimes. That sometimes we, who God has fearfully and wonderfully made and even put us in paradises at time, and we take our free will and so misaim it that it's as if we could make God having regretted bringing us into being in the first place. It's almost like a parent looking at just a hard head child and say, you know, that night me and your daddy should have just went to sleep. <laughs> we should have just saved the sweat and the seed. Should have just, and y'all laughing, but some of y'all have said something close to that in your spirit. That we've almost moved God to suggest that he didn't see this coming. And one of the times in which God, the scripture says that God spoke that, not lying on God, but trying to give the reader of the text a sense of the gravity of how bad people had behaved, was after God had raised up the first king of Israel, Saul. Saul was so bad that one writer said Saul was tall and that's all. He was just tall, and that's all. Saul was the first king of Israel. Israel had been a, 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 a theocracy, theocracy, state, government. One writer said that it's good theology, but it's bad administration. To suggest that they were 12 loose confederacy with, with, without a central government, without a a monarchy, uh, a president, a prime minister. So it was a loose confederacy of 12 tribes. That's what the whole book of Judges is about. When a threat, when an enemy encroached upon their borders, God would raise up a judge. And that was somebody in whom the spirit of God, the Ruah, different from the Numa and the Paraclete in the New Testament, the understand the Old Testament, understanding the Holy Spirit, the Ruah would come upon you externally, invest you with supernatural power so that you could lead God's people to repel the threat. And then once the threat was put down, said person would assimilate back into civilian life until the next threat came up and then God would raise up another judge. And that sounded good rhetorically that we don't have no head but God. But over time, Israel's borders were being nibbled away at the tribal land designations, because they couldn't hold off these enemies that, like inflation, just kept coming, eating into your paycheck. Your check ain't getting no bigger, but the cost of things is getting greater, so it seemed like some gremlins is shrinking your check. Hmm? It's like putting on pounds and trying to get in the same clothes and you swear that the cleaners shrunk your suit. And, and so after a while, people started saying, give us a king to rule over us. They weren't necessarily rejecting God. They were just noticing that this administration, this this, this, this way of organizing themselves as a people wasn't a good military defense strategy. Their borders were being nibbled away at. 
And they started asking for a king because they noticed nations with a king, with a commander in chief who had the power to compel in a very organized and proactive way. Troops into battle was better at protecting sovereign boundaries. People like 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 the prophet Samuel took offense to it. They thought that the people didn't trust God enough to be able to handle this situation. Sometimes when the situation, as Foster said, new occasions teach new duties, time and his ancient good uncouth. Sometimes when the situation or the situation calls for a different tact, a different approach, sometimes we over spiritualize our arrangements and assume that all that God can do is done in this one form. So when it's time to change the form and the approach, we swear that with some demonic impulses, people are rejecting God because we've only known God to work that way. And we forget that the same God who said, I am the same yesterday, today and forever did not mean to suggest that the only thing I can do is what I've done. Because that same God says, behold, I make all things new. And so Samuel, great as he was, missed it because he was vested in the old order of the judges. Because God was making a new move and getting ready to transition the nation into a monarchy. So then what was the problem, Reverend? Glad you asked. The first king that God rose up was Saul, who was tall. And it turns out that that's all. Saul angered God on a lot of different levels. One of them was that he went into the Holy of Holies that was reserved for just the priests. See, ain't nobody above the law. And everybody has boundaries and only the mediators, the priests, once a year are supposed to go into the Holy of Holies and, and take the blood of the Paschal Lamb and splatter it on the mercy seat and make an atonement for people's sin. Saul thought that being lifted up as king of Israel entitled him to do whatever he wanted to do. Be careful of those people who see their election as an entitlement to do whatever they want to do. And God got so angry that Saul had overstepped his boundaries. The prophets had said, is now Saul also one among the prophets? God got so angry, said he repented, even allowing Saul to become king, as if God could make a mistake. He overstates the point to make the point of how angry God was. And at that point, God moves God's anointing. Anointing is not in the comic book way we refer to anointing today as somehow or another, some magical endowment that falls on you when service gets hot. Ooh, that child's her anointing was all over her this morning. That's you might as well put that in with the um, with the Justice League or. Some comic book characters. The anointing means chosen. Saul lost his anointing, his being chosen of God. Because if God can choose you, God can unchoose you. And when Saul overstepped his boundaries, God unchose him. As if almost like those of you get so mad at somebody's responses, you unfriend them. God pointed, clicked, and unfriended Saul that was tall, and it turns out, and that's all. And then God dispatched the prophet Samuel, because according to the protocols of ancient Israel, the way they anointed kings was that the priest would go and lay their hands on someone on behalf of God to anoint the king. So the head of state would be pointed out by having the hand of the head of the cult placed on them. Not cult in the negative way that we think about cult, but the head of the priestly order. 
There was no separation of church and temple then, or separation of state and temple. It was a theocracy. They weren't even pretending to have a wall of partition. No, it was one and the same. So God dispatched Samuel to go throughout Israel and find him the person who would be God's new king. He went through the nation and make a long story short, he came to the house of Jesse. Jesse was a shepherd. His sons were shepherds, tending sheep. He had eight sons. And the, lo- the last of them and the youngest of them was David. And almost like an overture to Cinderella, which is really invoking in a cultural kind of way the memory of this experience of David where a prince is looking for a princess and, and then all these daughters come before him and then it's the stepdaughter over there in the corner. Cultural mythology is always a spinoff of whatever is the dominant religion in a, in a nation. It's a spinoff of this experience of David who was the youngest of, of Jesse's sons. And then this was a culture in which the last shall be last, the first shall be first, and whatever station you were born into, you died from. There was no pretense of upward mobility. But the God for whom it would say the first shall be last and the last shall be first, who juxtaposes human order and turns things upside down until he turns them right side up because he has that kind of authority, sent Samuel out who brushed past all of the handsome, tallest sons of Jesse and said, give me that little ruddy, unshaven, prepubescent child over there, the precocious one, David. That's the one. The one that don't look like much of nothing. That's the one. At 15 years of age in 1025 B.C., Samuel laid his hand on David to be the future king of Israel because they had a king already on the throne. It was Saul who was tall and you all are paying attention this morning. David was anointed to be the future king of Israel. And my brothers and my sisters, that's my first point of my sermon. You all are going to go on to do great things. Because God has laid God's hand on you. But every destiny, every blessing anointed has a delivery time that is appointed. And when God first lays his hand on you, God lays his hand on you in terms of what you are destined to do down the road. Destiny is something that simply takes the hourglass of life and experience, turns it over in the sands, start rolling. But where you are now is not where you go end up and where you end up. You'll look back over it and see God laid his hand on your way back then at 15 years of age. When he had never even laid a razor to his whiskers, a prepubescent child was out in the field uh, amusing himself in the long, monotonous hours, tending his father Jesse's sheep, making marks on trees, and then putting a stone in a slingshot, and then throwing it up against that tree, and getting pretty good after a while, getting pretty accurate. And uh, David was out there, and the king, looking through the eyes of God, saw that this is God's future king at 15 years of age in 1025 B.C. Well, while David was anointed king in 1025 B.C., it would be 1010 B.C. before David became king of Judea in Hebron. Notice I said Judea. The details matter. That's the outer regions of power. David became king of Hebron. After David was anointed king at 15 years of age, 
David, a few years later, a little while after that, when the armies of Israel and the Philistines, their natural enemies, were perched in battle and the Philistines levied a challenge when they sent out nine foot, nine inch Goliath looking like Shaq on platform shoes. Geared up like the crowd that came to the Capitol January 6th. With the state of the arts, a veritable killing machine like uh, Killmonger in Black Panther with all of the pellets for all of the past kills, challenging Israel, send me a champion. And Saul, who was tall, quivering in fear, along with all the other soldiers, which included all of David's older brothers, Suited for battle, but it ain't how big the dog in the fight, but how big the fight is in the dog. There wasn't no fight in them dogs. And here they were talking about they were they were people of the God that made the morning, but nobody would step out there and face that giant. David, being the baby boy, was sent by Jesse to take rations to the battle lines for his older brothers. Take them a little cheese milk, egg butter for your brothers, not old enough to fight. And he got there, and from his precocious, brash eyes, he couldn't understand why all you soldiers in all that battle gear and all that training Sitting up there acting like the police down in Uvalde, Texas, when you got a killer inside, killing up your children and all y'all on pause. Kids texting out saying we dying in here. Come help us. And no reply. Looked all over. Couldn't find nobody. God looked all over, couldn't find nobody to step up to a challenge. All that singing in the temple, talking about he'll open doors that no one can shut, shut doors that no one can open. And no one's stepping up to the challenge. And David said, ain't nobody got no fight in them. I'll fight. They tried to strap him with Saul's armor, but it didn't work because Saul was tall. That's all. David was a little prepubescent kid. David said, the only thing I know how to fight with is a slingshot, but I done got pretty good. I took down a bear, a lion. Let me go with what I know, because you can only do you. Can't do nobody else. David went out there, Saul came out there with his thundering feet, looking like Raul of Robocop. David walked out there shuffling with his sandals, but believing that God was able, took, a, took five food, smooth stones from the brook, put them in the slingshot, slingshot, wound it up in his mind, looking at the head of Saul with his helmet. There was a little slot right in the forehead, so you get a little air in it, and David aimed for that little slot like the marks on that tree and slung that rock, and that rock was grabbed by the stone, was grabbed by the eternal stone, which guided it through the air. And in the aerial dynamics of God, turned that rock sideways and slithered through that little opening and oops, upside his head. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall. David would go on to lead the armies of Israel while Saul was still king. And after he would take out the Philistines again and again and again and again. When David came home, there was a ticker tape parade in downtown Israel, and they was, the women were singing, Saul is slain as thousands, but David is ten thousands. And, and, and hubris, ego, you want to talk about haterism. Even though Saul had put David over the armies and David did exactly what he was supposed to do, vanquish his enemies. What David wasn't supposed to do is get more shine than him. What they say, the one thing that gets you in trouble with Trump is to be in the press more than him. And Saul flipped on David. David had to go into hiding. He had to run behind enemy lines. He had to hide out among the very enemies of God, the enemies of Israel. David even had to play crazy at one point, walking around foaming at the mouth, scratching on wood. 
because they was looking for David. He played crazy. And when they saw, thought that he was crazy, he said, this is the great David. Get him out of here. We got enough crazy folk. We got enough folk living in tents around here, causing fires and craziness. He's, Get him out, out of here. And David, after that, he wrote that psalm where he said, I will, I will bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and all that is within me. My soul makes her boast in the Lord. In other words, God's redemption, sometimes it ain't pretty, but it's redemption nonetheless. And when your back's between a rock and a hard place, you really don't care how God rescues you. If God rescues you, it ain't got to be pretty. It's just got to work. I wish I had a praying church. And so all that in the rear view mirror, David, who was anointed by Saul to be the future king at 15, waiting on the blessing to come to pass. It would be 15 years later. His whole life times two before at Hebron, he would receive coronation roses. Anointed at 15, become king not until 30. Then seven more years of war after that before he became king, even unto Jerusalem, which would become capital. So it was 22 years in all before David, anointed to be future king at 15, actually sits on the throne with the coronation roses at age 37. And that's when David penned the hymn. When he wrote that the Lord has, he says, the stone that the builders rejected. God made the headstone of the corner. David understood that his rise to power came with it some controversy. There were some people who didn't believe he belonged where God had put him. And he had to fight through those doubts, those fears, those winds of op opposition. Because some people don't want you to get what God has in store for you. David knew that he was the stone that the builders rejected. Somebody say, but God. But God made him the headstone of the corner. And when David got where he was going, like y'all down the road, when you become the CEO, when you get elected to office, when you make that new invention, you have that breakthrough, when you're a part of the Fortune 500, when you are a mover and shaker in town, and then you look back, on this day and look back where God has brought you from here to there, wherever there ends up being, you'll say like David, the Lord has done this. And it's marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this. And it's marvelous in our eyes because there's some folks who never thought you could get there, underestimated you, and, and didn't want you to get there. And when you get there, you know it wasn't because of your scheming. It wasn't because you were so smart. It wasn't because you out slicked and outlasted the opponent. It's because the God who opens doors that no one can shut and the God who can shut doors that no fox or fool can open intended and purposed you to be there in the mystery of God's sovereignty. God chose you. Now I was 25 years of age. I just graduated from Colgate Rochester Divinity School. And during my senior year, First Shallow Baptist Church had a huge congregational split. The previous pastor walked out through his keys at the chairman of the trustee board. And he and his wife and children literally walked down the aisle out of service. People started throwing hymn books at each other. The um, two ambulances were called because three people had to be taken to the hospital. They had a brawl in church on Sunday morning. The police had to come in. Five people went to jail. Three people went to the hospital. And hundreds of people never came back to church again because of a fight in a church. People are talking about what the saints go marching in. What about when the saints go storming out? A fight in church on Sunday morning. And they called the seminary, Colgate Rochester Divinity School, and said, we need a preacher while we get ourselves together and, and, and form a committee, start looking for a new pastor. So we just need somebody to come and preach on Sunday morning. And the Black Church Studies Department dean at the time, Robert Michael Franklin, who would go on to become president of Colgate Rochester Divinity School, he came and got me. 
Because he said, you grew up in Bethlehem and Tacoma, and I know that was a stormy church. So you ain't, you, you, you accustomed to craziness in church. That's a strange qualification. That you come from a crazy people who say they know the Lord. If y'all wonder why I'm a little off sometimes, because you can tell the pot I was dipped from. <laughs> Can't walk through the water without getting wet. And uh, so he sent me in. There. He said, don't look to the right, don't look to the left, just preach. I was planning on going to Union Theological Seminary in New York City to do a Ph.D. in conjunction in Columbia. Um, and 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 so I said, OK, I'll preach, but I'm going on to do some Ph.D. work. And so I went, I preached, kept preaching. So then the folks said, why are we looking for what we already got? The people on the search committee, however, thought that a 25 year old with no pastoral experience was beneath them. You Negroes just had a fight on Sunday morning. What are you talking about beneath you? There was 55 people in a thousand seat sanctuary the first Sunday I preached and they was all sitting in the overflow. The building was beautiful, but the people were broken like the beggar sitting at the gate called beautiful. But sometimes even when a church is at a low ebb and it's a shell of its former sense, its perception is based in former glories. They're the only ones who don't realize that they tow up from the flow up. They thought I was beneath that. I just kept on preaching. The committee said we refuse to enter his name into consideration. And then the people got together and through the deacon board, they said, if you don't put his name in that candidacy, we will disband the committee. Another compulsion. They entered my name into nomination to make a long story short. I was elected to pastor. I stayed there 12 years. I came back here to pastor Mount Zion Baptist Church in 1999. The chairperson of the committee grudgingly, reluctantly, she called me and said, while well, I was waiting at my apartment, Pine Harbor uh, Apartments in, in downtown Buffalo, she said, uh, she didn't even call me reverend or pastor. She said, Mr. Braxton, she said, they elected you pastor. She didn't want me where I was, but it didn't matter because the Lord had done it. <laughs> and it was marvelous in my eyes. And David will go on to say that even though you are, the Lord anoints you over here, you may not get your coronation roses down here because every blessing that is destined has an appointment time and it may not come when you want him. But the chosen of God have to be patient because you're working on the timetable of God for whom a thousand years is as a day and a day is a thousand years. And sometimes we want quick and easy rise. And sometimes our rise providentially determined still is a slow ride. We don't get to take the elevator. You got to take the stairs and you build up your lungs and your legs on the journey. You got to take the stairs. It ain't all going to happen as fast as you want it or when you want it. God's ways are not his ways and God's time is not your time. But every blessing foretold will come to pass because God can open doors. David said the stone that the builders rejected. God has made the headstone of the corner. I know that I didn't get here because I was a better fighter than Saul's men. I know I didn't get here because I was smarter than Saul and his men. I know I didn't get here because I was slicker and shrewder. This is something that God did for me despite Saul, despite me, because it was in God's will for reasons only God knows. The Lord has done it is marvelous in our eyes. And then David says, you know what? When you realize something has happened because it was God's will more to spite you than because of you, you ought to have a sense enough to do the one thing that makes sense. The one thing that could be truly authentic. And that's praise God for it. He said, this is the day that the Lord hath made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. God made this day. God set this up. God set this in motion. God declared, let there be. 
God lined up all the stars in a way such that despite all the variables working against you, ever amounting to anything, God determined that you would leapfrog over others, better positioned in life, parents in a better situation, more money, more economics, and yet here you are at the head of the line, the last became first. And those who were first are now in your tailwind. This is a day God made this. And you ought to have sense enough to rejoice and be glad in it. Let, let, let me give you a window of application. Get out your way. There was a story of a, a graduation commencement exercise. And you know these commencement exercises, these formalities, jean they don't really make them with black folk in mind because we just work by different rules. There was a little boy, his, his mother was on drugs, daddy deposited seed and moved on, grandmama raised him. Because of the mama's health status and the lifestyle, the boy was born two months premature so he wasn't fully developed and formed. He had to be in the incubator for months before he could come home. The drugs had gone through the umbilical cord and he had lots of health challenges. He was sickly through his whole childhood. They thought it had done even damage to his brain. He had lots of learning disabilities. He was kept back and they had said early in his educational career, he'll never really be able to learn beyond the third grade level. Grandmama wasn't accepting that. She said, this is God's child. He's fearfully and wonderfully made. And God can do anything. Every night that boy went to sleep, grandmama prayed over him and just said, Lord, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. I know you can do it. She got him special tutors and put him in special programs. He had to go through special ed. She worked with him. He was severely ADD. On top of that, he was dyslectic and things got turned around in his head. But grandma, despite all that pressed on his, she would tell him, boy, you're going to be something by day. And then she would pray over him by night. Fast forward 22 years later, come graduation service at the college. And he's among the graduates having fulfilled all the requirements to receive his Bachelor of Arts degree. At the program, it said at the bottom, please withhold your applause till after all names have been called. Everybody reads that and assume that includes them except black folk. <laughs> and when the boys roll, because there are several hundred graduating that, but when the boys roll was asked to get up and get in line, grandmama stood up in the back where her and the granddaddy was, was, was seated. And granny says, baby, sit down. And she swatted his hand away and she stood up. And when the boy, the line kept moving on, when he got up on the platform, there were still several people ahead of him. And when she saw him up on the platform, she started howling out, the Lord has done it. The Lord has done it. The Lord has done it. Tears started streaming down her eyes. Her husband was pulling at her skirt. She kept swatting his hand. She just got loud. The Lord has done it. Other people who stayed quiet when their children's name were called were looking at her like, who are you to disrupt the program? She didn't pay him no attention. She was just focused on the miracle of that grandbaby with all of them disadvantages crossing across that stage. She said, the Lord has done it. Finally, the master of ceremonies went into the microphone. He said, please, people, be quiet and remain seated until after we have called all the names. She's act like she didn't hear it. The Lord has done it. And finally, when she only got louder, waving her hand and started jumping too as she said it, finally, the president himself walked to the microphone and he said, let her alone. He said, some things can't be scripted. And I just stopped by to tell you this morning, when you know that it's the Lord who's put you where you are, when you know that without God's help and power, you wouldn't have made it through where you were to where you are, 
When you know that when you look at the circumstances of the parents to whom you was born and the family situation that you had to overcome and the finances that weren't there and yet still God who can who can never leave the righteous forsaken nor his seed left begging bread. You found the money to get to school. You found the money to get through school. You found the money to eat a couple of times a week. It may have been top ramen but you still didn't go hungry. When you know that you are here today by God's doing I come to tell you sometimes you out you you holler out when it ain't on the program but it's never a bad time to tell God thank you have I got a witness have you ever been in the supermarket and you went from complaining about how much the groceries cost to being grateful for the fact that you can pay for it anyway the Lord has done it they call in security we got an issue on checkout number four because somebody done started shouting and folk don't know why you shouting have you ever been in the elevator on your way back to work to that same old demon called your boss and you all of a sudden realize that God can do more for you than the boss can do against you despite all the shenanigans you're still there have I got a witness and you just start to hollering right there in the elevator folk think you crazy but they don't know like you know what the Lord has done for me it may not be on the program but it's show written in my heart thank you for being my burden bearer thank you for being my heart fixer thank you for being the bridge over my troubled waters thank you for the tuition thank you for the room and board thank you for the tutors that stayed up with me thank you for the teachers that believed in me thank you for my grandma my big mama, my nana, who just wouldn't accept that I wouldn't be nothing. Thank you for those who prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time that prayed for me. The Lord has done this. It's marvelous in my eyes. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. This is a day that the Lord has made. Y'all to have sense enough to be thankful and be glad in it if you're glad about what God is doing in your life. If you're glad about what God has done for you. If you're glad about what God helped you overcome. If you're glad about every mountain he brought you over. Every trial he brought you through. Every blessing. Can you just say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Say yeah. Hey. 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 <laughs> the best praise in the world is an unscripted praise. <laughs> oh, come on. I know y'all sophisticated and sadiddy, <laughs> but have you just ever been in a moment where you couldn't hold it? <laughs> it's inappropriate, it ain't on the program. But when I start thinking of his goodness and all he's done for me, right then I can't put that on pause. My soul cries out, hallelujah. Right here in traffic, hallelujah. <laughs> Right here in my cubicle goal at work. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Doors of church are open. Perhaps there's someone here or in the digisphere where you're having a moment because you just start thinking about all that God brought you through. And you know if it hadn't been for God, you wouldn't be here. Maybe there's somebody who wants to accept God right now in the pardon of your sins or you need a church home where you can get closer to God. Because let me tell you something, if you got God, everything else will come in God's own time. God will feed you, protect you, lead you, 
Give your friends when you need them and handle your enemies. I wish I had two, three witnesses up in here. Y'all act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Don't ever get so cute you can't shout for God and over what God has done for your life. Have I got a witness? Because God who blesses you, he can unbless you if you don't act like you're grateful. How many of you want God right now to know that you're thankful for everything, everything, anything, for the big things and the small things? Don't let God, un- don't let God delete his blessings because you don't have sense enough to say thank you. Whosoever will. If you're out in the digital sphere, hit that button, how do I become a member? Whosoever will. If you're in here today and you need a church home, why don't you come on down this aisle? Whosoever will. Whosoever will, won't you come? Oh, this is the day. Yes, it is. That the Lord. Whosoever will. This is the day. This is the day the that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I shall, I will rejoice, I ain't talking about nobody else, I, I shall, and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is, oh, this is the day that the Lord has made, I shall, I can't speak for nobody but me. Oh, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Listen, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has. I will, will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. 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 I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. This is the day. This is the day. Yes, it is. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. And be glad. And be glad. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has.